So good morning, Friday morning, and I've actually uh, pre-recorded today's interview because I am finally going back to start slowly going back to work. So I'm shooting this morning and I am really delighted to be joined with a really good friend of mine, Annie Sturk. And if you don't know about Annie, then you soon will find out about her because she's had such an extensive career in the food and television world and has a really inspiring attitude to life. So good morning, Annie. Good morning, Rachel. It's good so morning. nice to see you. And you. you. I know, I've really missed We've gone from literally probably oh, no. September to February. We, we, we spoke yeah. to each other every single week and our team for the Silver yeah, Sassy event to, to being in lockdown. It has been really quite strange, hasn't it? It's been really strange. It's been really strange. And I've missed all the work stuff and all the silver and sassy event planning and working with all with working with the team working yeah. with the girls because it, it was such fun and we had so much planned and then in the space of a, an hour you know it all kind of fell apart didn't it and it we really were, did within we're a week lockdown. yeah i mean really yeah, it was literally the week before wasn't it it was the week before it was the week before but uh, but we have some great ideas in the pot don't we bubbling we away yeah the, we'll be back the, yeah we will be back yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Nobs> <laughs> so today i get the pleasure of kind of delving deeper into your career because you've really had um quite a remarkable career really and it's yeah i read your cv and you just there's not many people that you haven't worked in in the, in the food industry so when you left school did you always know that you wanted to work in the food arena somewhere well it, it, it's a funny thing i just remember I, I always had a lot of satisfaction from being in and around food and i think my earliest memories when uh, i used to come home from school were mum mum was a very good baker and my, my i had an uncle billy and an uncle jack who who had a baker's shop in castleford and i remember going buying cream horns and you know seeing them come out of the bakery at the back covered in flour so it it was always, it was, I suppose it was always there, but you never really know what influence your childhood has on you, but obviously quite a big influence. And, and my mum was a fantastic um, uh, baker and she had this weekly baking session. And I remember coming home from school once and I think she was out, I don't know where she was. And she'd left all the, all the, you know, sort of tarts and buns and things on in the kitchen covered with a tea towel. And, and I went in and I just thought, gosh, this is, there was nobody else in but me and I just thought gosh I'm gonna I'm gonna eat this lot if I'm not careful but it, and I just remember just thinking it, it was just so nice there's something about baking isn't there that we all kind of enjoy and to be honest I wasn't a, I wasn't an academic at school um you know I was never I was never particular English I was good at but uh, but apart from that there was not no subject apart from home economics and mm. um and it, it just seemed a natural, natural progression, really. And I went to college, um, I went to school in Leeds, uh, Notre Dame Grammar, and then went to, um, it was called the Yorkshire College of Education at Home Economics, but mm. then became part of Leeds Poly. So I did the three-year teacher training course there. And, um, and then that was it, launched myself into schools, <laughs> and uh, which I loved. I just, uh, I just loved it. I just loved it. I think it was a combination love teaching and love yeah. love being in and around food yeah so how did so, that how did that take you into the, the the food and television world how did you make that transition it's a funny thing isn't it how how things happen um i think when we moved it was quite late on actually it didn't it didn't happen overnight and um there were i think there was a bbc2 program food and drink remember the one with michael yeah. barry and yes. Gilly Goulden? yeah um, and they were wanting people to do um wanting people to sort of do some uh, a project on cooking 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 sources and uh, so i i put myself forward i, I don't know how i thought i had the brass neck to do it but i did and uh, and I just thought I'm going to give this a go. So I've got a team of, of women together and men from from Stillington, and uh, and we all sort of cooked in different ki kitchens with all these cooking sauces to see which came out the best. Mm. But um, and before that, I, I had been teaching as well. I'd been uh, working in an adult education centre, which was affiliated to Aspen Bryan College. Mm. So I was kind of in that, you know, kind of in that world. 
and um, but it was great fun and from that I'm, uh, I met a TV producer and that in itself led to working on um, a, a programme and that's how it rolled really Rachel it was funny really and you'll know the same with, with, with your career and what you've done it's, it, it's often you just meet people along the way and yeah. that opens doors and, and I was just really lucky that's what happened just doors opened I met different producers different TV researchers who put me forward for different jobs because mm. I think you know if if you can if you worked hard and you were just ready willing and able and not too expensive <laughs> people people were quite ready to hire you and, and you know I was I was good at my job um yeah. I was very conscientious and worked hard and you know put a lot of effort in and and it paid off and yeah and it but it, also it, but also you did have that mindset that you were willing to, to take on a challenge, whereas lots of people, their fear of doing something different and taking themselves out of, the, out of their comfort zone might have put them off, whereas you seem to have just taken each challenge as it comes. Yeah, and it, it's, it's funny that, isn't it? Because I know a, 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 lot of, a lot of people have said that, but it's funny, I don't know what, I don't know what, what it is that... that gave me that I never thought of it as a thing I never thought mm. gosh um and I think because I worked freelance um you know working freelance when I first started it it's um it's it's a strange thing because you you never say no that the mantra is never say no mm. so you say you say yes and then you think oh my god how am I going to do it but you actually do do it yeah because and it's true isn't it if you do say no you always regret it mm. and then you see somebody else doing what you've said no to and you know you watch them rise and then you're yeah. <laughs> so I think that was it really just always that feeling to say to say yes but but the original break into television was um I, I was actually um still teaching at the time and I used to watch this morning and and wanted to be a presenter on this morning and I suppose being young young and a bit <laughs> and a bit gung-ho and a bit ballsy I used to write to them and say hey can I be a, a you know food presenter and they say no go away you've got who are you you anyway you know who do you think you are go away um, but then one day, uh, one of the research, then one of the producers phoned me and said, "Look, we, we need a home economist on the program. Um, can you come along and uh, be interviewed?" So I went along, and uh, they offered me a six-week contract, and I uh, just accepted a year's contract to teach at York College. And um, so I had the most agonising decision to make: six weeks or a year. Yeah, this was like, oh. Um, but anyway, obviously, it took the six week contract and it just it, it just went from there, really. So I had a ball on this morning. Absolutely. I pinched myself every single day. I was. Oh, I bet you did. Yeah. I mean, to be yeah. put yourself in that arena and to, to be out there so much more in the, in the public arena, that must have been quite daunting. Or did you just feel like it was something you were really passionate about? So it didn't really feel like that. Do you know, it, it, it's funny, it didn't really feel like that. And they, because initially it wasn't, um, I, I wasn't sort of presenting, I was just working behind the scenes. The presenting came gradually mm. and, um, and, and the two ran alongside each other. I started to do lots of, uh, worked with a, with a, a, a great company in York, uh, Mandrill TV, and we did lots of um, kind of low budget, but fantastically fun television. Um, and I used to drive up and down the country at all hours of the day and night <laughs> with pots and pans and rattling. I didn't have a home ec, I just had to do everything myself, but pots and pans and mouldering food in the back. You know, like when I came back from a shoot, sound everywhere if we'd been on the coast. But uh, but no, it, it was just fun. And, you know, your your project is, you know, kind of out of the bubble. This, I suppose it you know being on location it was it was like being in a bubble really it was mm. this it was this strange little world of you know sort of I love the teamwork and and I love the creativity of it because there was nobody telling me what to do I just I just kind of made made it up as I went along and it just seemed to work yeah 
I mean, you've worked with loads of different chefs. I mean, you, you know, Ken Hom, um, you know, the, the list is, is extensive, Gloria Hunniford show. But yeah, what, what kind of work were you doing? Because people don't really appreciate the, the, the food stylist work that goes into producing a show like that. So what were the kind of things that your job entails? Well, uh, everything from um, the, basically when uh, I, I either worked on single uh, single programmes or a series, like a whole series, like mm. uh, Ken Hom's series was, uh, we, we went all over the country uh, filming in different locations with, with different experts. So we'd be on a, you know, pig farm or a fruit farm or, you know, that those kind of locations. So it was my job to take the recipe, um, pull it apart and break it into sort of easy to understand sections. Um, a bit like a bit like a choreo choreographer, really, mm. and um, and and so it was it was buying the food, buying the equipment, styling it, dressing it, propping it. So everything that you need, everything that you see on television, so Ken Hom's doing a recipe, mm. that that was something that my job as a home ex food stylist was to create that look. Mm. So down to the the table covering, the dishes that you saw the food in. Um, how the recipe was broken down, uh, what he did, what I did. I, I did all the his when I made earlier mm. um, uh, dishes and in, including anything that was that needed to be staged. So if you needed to show something kind of part finished at different stages, you had to have all that ready as well. And then because of filming, it wasn't that they didn't just do one take. So you had to have three or four lots of food ready yeah. in the background so already prepared so they do the big wide shot which is the master shot and then you'd have to reset to do um, the the, uh, the mid shot and then you'd have to reset again to get all the close-ups you know when you see hands yeah. going in dishes and jugs being poured so you don't see that on television yeah. but that sometimes was a real pain because yeah. If we didn't, I often worked just single handedly. And so trying to remember where everything was and, you know, whether it was picked up in the left hand or the right hand or, you know, it, yeah. the, the, there was, the director was there obviously as well. But um, often we'd be filming in sort of kind of challenging locations. So on windy seashores or in, you know, on a farm or, they weren't in studio setups so it was quite difficult to to manage you know everything felt quite messy yeah. but it had to look brilliant on <laughs> yeah I mean, that's a lot of work it's you know that's a lot of work and people it was don't a appreciate huge it. Amount of work. yeah huge amounts of work no no kitchen facilities you know you'd be washing everything up in a bucket so and then if something went wrong um, you know you, you'd you'd be using up your stuff that you knew you'd got safe for the next run through yeah. and it's something i just think oh god you know what if i haven't got enough so you're always on edge <laughs> mm. wondering if you had enough you know you had enough food prepped for it but yeah it was a bit scary sometimes so was it a hard industry to leave behind then and move on to something different or did you just come to a natural point where you just thought yeah actually i have time to move on to try something different i think i think it was just a natural end because um I think I think it's a it's a young girls young boys game actually, and and I just found it, it was physically very hard work because mm. you know you'd I'd, I'd have a, a, a you know a big estate car, and I had literally everything with me you know great crates of pots and pans and um, there was a lot of running about lots of trekking about you know if you couldn't get to the location to park easy a lot of walking you know across say we were in Norfolk you know on the on the sort of mud flats there it, it was it was physically hard work and, and I think it did just come to an uh, a natural end and you know what what I was one thing that I loved about it I was able to train up several um, girls who came on work experience and who are still working in the business now and they're doing amazingly one of them Michaela she does Saturday Kitchen um, Claire Bassano does um, she does uh, the Sunday show weekend with Simon Rimmer. She yeah. does the Channel Four. Is it Channel Four weekend show? She does that. Yeah. yeah, both came. Both came on location with me, and you know, kind of got the bug, got yeah. the, you know, got the apron, got the t-shirt, and Brilliant. so I, I loved that side of it. I love that sort of 
you know, mentoring and training side. It goes back to my teaching again. Yeah. So, so Which when you left, when you left that, what did you go on to do next? Um, well, I started to do some PR actually. I was I, I worked um, with a, a colleague, and we looked after the PR for York Festival of Food and Drink. So I basically treated it like a big um, TV program, and sort of I pulled in a few favours from mates who like Brian Turner came up to do demos. Sophie mm. Grigson came up. And we did that for five years and that was fantastic fun. And then um, that sort of came to an end as well. Mm. I did lots of things in, in, in blocks of five years. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I love that. No, nothing wrong with that. No, not at all. Um, so, that, so that was good. And then, uh, and then I set up my own PR business, Absolutely Food. Um, and that, you know, in a way... You know, I suppose I've had my five minutes of fame and what was lovely about Absolutely Food was was giving food producers um, their five minutes of fame. Mm. So getting them onto telly if we could, on the radio, in the in the press, um, doing doing wacky things. I love coming up with wacky mm you know, daft creative ideas. Some of them were too far fetched for some of the <laughs> some of the clients. But but yeah, that that was good. And I had a, a about ten years actually with Yorkshire Life magazine working as a food consultant and I chaired the um the team of judges for the food and drink awards. So um so I, I have been I have been really lucky to have had such a varied career all in food and drink met lots of lots of fab people and and but had fun I think I think that's the big thing with it I think with everything I've done it's been fun yeah um scary yeah <laughs> sometimes yeah as as, as things are because yeah I, I think the PR was quite challenging work mm. um because you're managing people's expectations and um it's not like you know kind of going into a shop and buying a dress and paying money and you get the dress with PR it's kind of you know you're selling you're selling ideas to them you're selling something that sometimes can't be seen mm -hmm. until you get the coverage and sometimes there's a lot of work you need to do behind the scenes before you yeah. get the coverage so so that was tricky um, and now you know, and now, as an now. Again, now, the next chapter, <laughs> modelling. I know, <laughs> why did that happen? just amazing. <laughs> How did that happen? How, where, where did you get the kind of... Well, it was, it was really, it, it, was a, it was a wet, miserable February. Um, I'd retired from uh, my PR, I, you know, sort of hung up my whatever you hang up when you, <laughs> when you retire. And... Um, there was an advert on Facebook and it said, fancy being a model, no experience required. So I just, <laughs> I just thought, what the hell? And I'd, we'd been to, um, we'd, we'd been to a sort of um, Gatsby event down in York at the John Cooper theatre studio. And uh, so I'd just taken a selfie before I went, before we left. Ken was sort of taking ages to get ready. <laughs> so I took this selfie. <laughs> sent that in and they they sort of said oh yeah no that's great you know come along for a for a photo session um but it was actually not a model agency it was just one of these platforms that mm. you 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 pay for so I had to pay for the privilege mm. but it's funny I've, I've always loved clothes I've always loved fashion and even on windy wild you know windswept places setting up for my for the or the chefs I would always I've always had my lippy on I've always had I've always tried to look it's it's meant it's always meant a lot to be mm. to, to look okay and you I'm, always I'm, look amazing you always look I can imagine you on sets you always <laughs> look fantastic <laughs> but yeah so so I, I enjoyed that part of it um kind of dressing up so mm. it, it kind of it, it wasn't it wasn't sort of so far out from what I what I've been doing, and mm. um, yeah, and and it's kind of gone from there really. It's just, and then obviously getting um, involved with your Fashion Week team has been fantastic, and then obviously meeting you, Rachel, and 
um, you know, and, and, and setting up Silver and Sassy together has just been, it's been amazing. It's yeah, really has. Fantastic, really good. And, so where did and you get the idea for, where did you get the idea for, for Silver and Sassy? Well, I think because my, my hair's always, my hair's always been a thing. I've been, I've been going grey for, for years. I stopped colouring it because I got fed up of, you know, getting the dye out. So I mm. sort of ditched the dye and, and it was always steely grey and then gradually it, become, it became white. And, um, and I just thought, um, when I started to speak to your fashion, I thought, you know, I've always, I, I've always thought, you know, kind of your hair really, it, it is your crown and glory. I know lots of women had, had sort of said to me, oh, I wish I could, I wish I dare let mine grow out, but I dared and, and um, I wish mine was white like yours. And, and I just thought, well, um, Sorry. I just I just thought um, it would be really good to do something that um, that that would showcase women with grey silver or white hair mm -hmm. and and I thought well I, I can't do it on my own I need a I need a, a conspirator to do it <laughs> so yeah so we, we got together didn't we and yeah. um, and you said yes because you're one of life's go-getters and uh I just you know, completely yes. yeah, yeah I completely got what you wanted to try and achieve uh, immediately yeah. was on board it, I didn't even have to think about it it's something that I completely uh, I totally agree with you and um, we've yeah. got such a great team behind us uh, I can't wait to get going again with it next year we've got a really really great set of models and I think it'll have a real impact it's exciting it is no it's it's really exciting I'm I'm really looking forward to it but yeah, we're, we're probably going to have to be a, a bit more creative than, than we yes. thought we were. Yeah. Well, I think we were pretty creative with it, weren't we? Were. With what we had planned. Yeah, yeah, we can do it. We can, we're good at we thinking can. outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> outside so, the box. so now you are, you've just turned 70. And yeah. It's amazing in those photographs that you shared recently. How do you feel about aging? Because it's obviously not slowing you down and you've, you've got so many other things that you want to achieve. Yeah, I feel, um, I feel that I want to go on forever. It's, it's really weird, isn't it? Mm. I just, I feel, I feel I don't want to slow down. And um, I, I do, I do kind of worry about aging. Um, you know, I, I think that if you've got energy and health, um, because you need you need your health, and mm. and you know, I'm I'm touching wood, hoping that you know I I, I stay healthy, and I try uh, try my best to to look after myself. You know, I do a lot of walking. Mm. I don't do much else. I have to say to keep it, but try mm. and eat healthily, um, keep optimistic, and 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 keep busy. But um, but it, it it does worry me because um, it's actually a doctor friend of ours who said he said um, a couple of years ago said so, well we are in the last you know we're in the last segment now said, oh great <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thanks for that but it's kind of um, yeah I don't want to get off the, the the sort of you know roundabout really it's um, now I'm. I'm really, um, really enjoying things. So um, yeah, I, 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 I think if you can, if you have health and you can do things, um, I think just, I think that's the, that, that's the key really, just to keep doing as much as you can and don't, don't let your chronological age mm -hmm. be the thing that, you know, oh, I'm 70, so I should be sitting in yeah. a chair yeah. having a cup of cocoa because you know if you can get out and do stuff and I, and I do think that there's so much um around and available now is, isn't the thought for women of you know 50 60 70 yeah. you, do, you don't have to sit back and and wait for the inevitable do you you definitely you really need to try and em embrace it for as for as long as you can and I do know that you know there are a lot of people who can't mm. for whatever reason but um no I'm I'm, I'm determined there wasn't there was a time there when I 
I don't know, I don't know whether you found this, that you, you don't want to tell people what your age is, do you? Because it, well, it, it used to be a bit of a barrier, didn't it? Did you find yeah, that? I think maybe, no, I did not. I kind of, I really didn't like being 30. I really struggled with being 30. When I turned 30, I thought, yeah. gosh, is this it? And I, I really quite felt quite depressed about being 30. Um, yeah. Whereas in my forties, I I was always quite proud of the fact that I was in my forties. It didn't really bother yeah. me at all. But I think it's as each generation is going through it, we've all got slightly different attitudes yeah. in society to aging, haven't we? Which I think is getting better. Yes, yeah. And it it isn't a barrier, is it? Now, no. now. I think uh, you know you can you know within reason you can you can have a go at uh, doing anything, and I, mm. and I think. Um, you, you, you do have to sort of um, get through that that barrier that you know should I be doing this? I, th I, I do think. Do you think yeah. there's that? Yeah, I think thought. there is definitely. I think it's that judgment, isn't there, that people still need to get yeah. over? Yeah. 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 Is it the right? What will people think? And I, and I just think, you know, you've. I, I think you your your positivity about just just going for things and not not letting things be a barrier not letting age be a barrier you're very much into that aren't you so that's yeah I am that's it's, something you... yeah I think it's and I don't know why I am I just kind of maybe it's a stubborn streak in me well I, I, I don't think it's it's whatever it is it doesn't matter does it but I right. think that that focus in that you you know you can be important whatever age you are you can do things whatever age you are and don't let things you know prejudice other people's prejudices get in the way yeah so um so yeah in it yeah is like oh god how did, how did, how did i get here but i am so you know and um kind well, of you know lots of people from there know. Well, yeah. let's just watch this space. And I can't wait to see what you can get up to in the next five years of your career. <laughs> and I can't wait until our Silver and Sassy team are all back up and running. It'll be uh, oh, great to be back together yeah. again. So thank it's you so well. much. It's been lovely to find out more about you today. It's been really good fun. <laughs> and lovely to see you. Bye. So take care of yourself and um, enjoy the rest of your day. And I will catch up with you soon. I'm sending lots of love. Yeah, lots of love to you, Rachel. Yeah, Thanks, bye Annie. for now. Bye. 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 <laughs>